Well, happy Resurrection Sunday, everyone. <laughs> I tell you, we got something even better on them. Right. And that's that uh, for us, every Sunday is Resurrection there Sunday. You go. There you go. So we're going to celebrate the Resurrection today, and uh, next Sunday we'll come back and do it again, and the Sunday right. after that. Right. So I, I kid, but only slightly kid. I, I do believe that... Uh, Sometimes that undue emphasis can take away from the beauty of the Lord's Day, the one day in seven. Wait. You don't have to wait around for a special holiday that happens once or twice or three times a year. We have one day every week that the Lord has given us to Amen. set aside to worship Amen. Him and praise Him for the resurrection. And I thank Him, the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day that we have each week. I know I'm preaching to heavy hearts this morning. And I have nothing within me to offer, but I want to hasten to the Word of God this morning, wherein we can find comfort and Amen. rest for our souls. If you would, Titus chapter number 2 this morning, Titus chapter number 2. I'm going to preach this morning on grace personified. Amen. Grace personified. Titus chapter number 2, beginning there at verse 11. These are the words of God. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Amen. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Amen. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Amen. You'll understand that the book of Titus is a pastoral epistle. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the young Titus as he was uh, being sent to the small island of Crete to set in order those things that were still wanting. And Paul wrote this letter to encourage Titus in the ministry and to give him and the church practical directives for how they were to live, how they were to serve God, Amen. and how they were to structure the local assembly there in Crete. Much of Titus chapter number 1 and the beginning of Titus chapter number 2 are filled with practical directives, the do's and the don'ts of the Christian life. Mm -hmm. And you understand, the Lord's people are oftentimes simple-minded. And sometimes we just need God to tell us, do this and don't do that. Right. Uh, we amen. don't need a lot of lengthy explanation. Uh, some of the parents here will say amen to that. Right. Sometimes your children don't need to know why. Uh, they just need to know, do this and don't do that. And Amen. you'll understand it better by and by. Yeah. And so Paul is writing this letter to Titus, and it's a very straightforward letter, a very pointed epistle. <coughs> but then he comes to the end of chapter 2, and he pauses there after giving these directives, and he begins to lay the foundation for the godliness which we are to possess in the Christian life. He gives Titus the explanation for the directives that he has thus far given them. Mm -hmm. And the foundation that Paul lays, the pillar upon which life and godliness is to rest, is upon the grace of God. Lest we lose sight of why holy living matters to God, Paul ends this chapter by calling our attention back to the graciousness of our God. Amen. 
you realize that eternity was forever shaped when God sovereignly decided to act in grace. That's it. Towards Amen. Mankind. You're right. He, he must have made a positive decision to be gracious. That's it. There was nothing within us that would incline God You're to right. be gracious. Yeah. Therefore, we know that God manifested His grace by a deliberate choice. Mm -hmm. His arm was not twisted. His hands were not tied. There was no pardoning. There was no bargaining. But it was because He purposed within Himself to act with grace. That's it. Amen. Towards those whom He has created. And because of that choice, human history was forever shaped and altered. And the course of our world was set in order because of God's one decision to be gracious. Yeah. I want to say to you that Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the grace of God. Amen. The grace of God is not a thought. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. The grace of God is a person. And if you want to know what the grace of God looks like, look no further than to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The person of Christ and all that he has accomplished is the basis for God's unmerited favor towards undeserving men and women. His virgin birth, his sinless life, his death on the cross, his glorious resurrection, his second coming, they're all rooted in the grace of God. Amen. If it's not for God's grace, Jesus Christ would have never come and did any of those things. Amen. Jesus Christ is the grace of God incarnate. Mm -hmm. In Jesus Christ, for 33 and a half years, the grace of God dwelled in this Jesus of Nazareth. And as he walked the earth, wherever he went, there went the grace of God. Amen. And even before his incarnation, Jesus Christ possessed the fullness of God's grace in eternity. And right now, the grace of Jesus Christ is still being manifested through the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. If you want to find grace, you must go to Him. Mm -hmm. You'll never find it anywhere else. Amen. There's not one drop of grace outside of Christ. But all of the goodness of God and all of the abundant blessings of God are contained within the glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. And in these verses, at the end of Titus chapter number 2, Paul provides a Christocentric overview of redemptive history from the first advent to the second advent. From coming to coming. Mm -hmm. And right smack dab in the middle of Christ's first coming and his second coming is the glorious work that he accomplished on the cross. Ascending upward from the divine testimony of scripture stands that towering edifice called Mount Calvary. Amen. And it sheds its shadow abroad over all of the Bible and all of redemptive history. The cross of Christ is central to the purpose and plan of God. Amen. This is the cornerstone of all that Christ is and does. The death of Christ is a deep and wide ocean that human man will never be able to fully explore. The death of Christ is an inexhaustible truth. There is no end in our plunging into the depths of Christ's death upon the cross. We debate many different doctrines in Christian theology. We go back and forth on so many things. We like to argue about the timing of the second coming well, let me tell you this. When Jesus returns, you will know all there is to know about his second coming. Mm -hmm. But as the eternal ages roll on, you will still be ever learning of the gloriousness of the cross of Christ. Amen. You will never get to the end of that lesson. You need to 
get to the heart of what took place on that rugged tree. Amen. That's why he came the first time. And the cross is why we can know with all assurity that he's coming again. All hinges upon the cross. Amen. And so Paul would have us to live our Christian lives with one side of our peripheral vision fixated upon the first coming of Christ and the other side of our peripheral vision fixated on the second coming of Christ. Amen. But the focal point of our vision should ever be locked into what Christ did in his gracious sacrifice upon Calvary. Amen. That's how we're to live the Christian life. Mm -hmm. And when we live it that way, when that becomes our worldview, when that becomes what drives us and what pushes us and what motivates us, all of those practical directives fall in their proper place. Mm -hmm. Live your life anchored in the reality of Calvary. So what I want to do is examine these verses in the order in which Paul presents them. The first coming of Christ, building up to the second coming of Christ, and crescendoing with the death of Christ. Let's look at that first coming in verse 11. Paul says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I want you to understand it's God's grace that brings salvation. Amen. Redemption is an act of divine grace and mercy. Amen. Who we could not redeem ourselves, who we were wholly unable to save ourselves, it is only because of the riches of Christ's grace that we've been called in to this salvific relationship with the God of heaven. Mm -hmm. And Paul says something quite remarkable here about that grace. He says that that grace has appeared to all men. Mm -hmm. What does the apostle mean? I think two things are meant here in this text. Obviously, Paul does not mean that it's appeared to all men without exception. Mm -hmm. That is, every single individual in the exact same way. For there are yet those who know nothing of the salvific grace of God. Right. What does Paul mean? I believe it's fitting with the context. If you read chapter number 2, it's clear that Paul is saying that the grace of God has appeared to all kinds and types and categories of men. It has appeared to all men without any distinction whatsoever. He's the God not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles also. And the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to the Christians. And it's appeared to those in Galatia. And it's appeared to those in Rome. And it's appeared now to those living in North America. Amen. Even here in Tennessee, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto us. Amen. We perceived this grace. If you look at chapter 2, he, he's going through directives to all these different categories. He talks about the young men and the aged, women, and the aged men and the young women and the aged women. All of these different categories. God has manifested mm -hmm. His grace to them. There is no one who is outside of the scope of God's grace. There's no such thing as the right color to be saved, for the right age to be saved. But Christ is redeeming a people of every tribe, mm -hmm. of every tongue, Amen. and of every kindred. I think there's going to be two grand surprises in heaven. I think we're going to be surprised by who is there, and I think we're going to be surprised by who's not there. Right. Because the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is no respecter of persons. And the salvation that he has come to provide hath appeared to all men. But I think that there's yet another truth here in this text. It's one that's often overlooked when he says that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I think that there is a quantitative aspect to that word, all men. And I don't think that we need to play spiritual gymnastics with that word. Right. See, here's how we often think about it. We think that at, at the end of this thing, when history is consummated, there's going to be a tiny little handful of frozen chosen that are saved and this vast multitude cast into hell. 
Well, friend, I don't believe that on the last day that the devil's going to have more than Jesus Christ. No. But I believe that on the last day, the salvific grace of God will so rule and reign in the hearts of an innumerable host of saints that we can rightfully say that His grace has appeared unto all men. I'll give you an illustration. If there was a concert in Dover, and so many of our citizens went to that concert, yeah, there might be a few that are still at home, but there's such an overwhelming majority that are at that concert, what would we say? We'd say all Dover went out to that concert. See what I'm saying? It's not universalism. And I think that on the last day, when Jesus Christ, the line of the tribe of Judah, when the Lamb is sitting upon His throne, and we see that sea of glass in the book of Revelation, and they're all singing praises unto the Lamb, we're going to look at that host of angelic beings and host of saved men and women, and we're going to say, His grace hath appeared to all men. <laughs> I don't believe we can fathom that mm -hmm. with our human minds today. Right. The richness and the glory of His grace. What He's doing now and what He'll continue to do. The grace that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. But I want you to see this is, this is in the context of His first coming. Well, what, what are the effects of that grace on those that have received it? Well, He goes on to say in verse 12, Teaching us, who's the us? Again, it's those who have experienced the saving grace of God. Teaching us. See, not only does the grace of God bring us into salvation, but it continues to teach us and to train us and to disciple us and to equip us to all good works that God would have us to do. Amen. You know why so many Christians can't run the race? Because they think that to get in, they have to do it by grace. <laughs> but then to live the Christian life, they're going to do it by the will of their own flesh. Mm -hmm. It's not so. Amen. <laughs> but from redemption to consummation, the totality of your Christian life will be lived by the grace of God. Amen. And this grace teaches us. It changes us. It shapes us. What does it teach us? It teaches us that, verse 12, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. One cannot encounter the saving grace of God and not be transformed. Amen. But having been, been freed from the dominion of sin and given a new nature, their salvation begins to manifest itself in their way of life. And we see a positive and a negative manifestation. The negative manifestation is in this word denying. The grace of God teaches us to deny some things. Amen. Grace teaches us to say no to sin. Amen. Grace teaches us to repudiate ungodliness. It's the grace of God that when those things come into our lives and when we encounter those temptations, it's the grace of God that's going to rise up within us and say, No! Amen. Amen. And if you're relying on your flesh to do that, you're going to fall every time. You're right. But it's the grace of God that perseveres in those moments when we are too weak within ourselves. When I fear my faith will fail. Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter should prevail, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. Amen. Not as a means of maintaining our salvation. That's not why we deny ungodliness. But because of an understanding that we can no longer live in the sins that Jesus died to save us from. Amen. You're right. You understand that. Why did he have to die on the cross of Calvary? To purge you from your sin. Mm -hmm. And how can you that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How can you go on enjoying the things that put the Lord to death? Right. Uh, have nothing to do with them. You're not under the dominion of those sins anymore. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. That's the negative manifestation. But look at the 
in manifestation. We didn't, after we've denied ungodliness and after we've denied worldly lusts, Paul says we should. This is the positive, what we're supposed to do. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Right. Having first rejected ungodliness, we now accept godliness. That's the pattern. We, we first denied what is wrong, and now we've affirmed what is right. Mm -hmm. See, here's the thing. You, you'll never be able to live rightly unless you first stop living wrongly. Amen. If you're driving down the road and you're going the wrong direction, the first step to getting back on track is stopping. Mm -hmm. You need to stop before you can turn around. Mm -hmm. Paul says we need to live soberly, with vigilance, circumspectly. We need to live righteously. That is living in the things that Jesus Christ loves. Mm -hmm. Living in the light of the reality of his character. And we need to live godly. Like and unto him. Do you know what godliness is? It's so simple. Godliness is understanding who God is and living in light of that fact. Mm -hmm. So in order to live godly, you first must know who he is. You Amen. must study his attributes. Amen. When's the last time you've read some literature or heard a series of messages on the attributes of God? Mm -hmm. Simply who God declares himself to be in his word. And then once you understand who he is, then you must understand who you are. And any time you come to a place in your own life and in your own character that doesn't align with who God is, there's a problem there. And you need to change and conform like unto Him. Amen. That's godliness. And Paul says this is the way that we who have received the saving grace of God are to live and conduct ourselves. Mm -hmm. Where are we supposed to do this? Surely that's something we do in church on Sunday mornings, right? Surely that's just something we do at conferences and at fellowship times. No, Paul says we do that in this present world. Amen. Hmm. The transforming grace and practical godliness are to be present realities consistently manifested in our Christian life. It's by grace that God unites spiritually dead sinners with Christ and quickens their souls and regenerates their hearts and gives them a new nature that eschews evil and desires righteousness. Amen. And the one who has not experienced this change has not experienced the grace of God. You're right. Because there are no stillborn children in the family of God. Yeah. But everyone who be borns again will manifest a newness of life. Mm -hmm. I totally reject with everything in me the doctrine of the carnal Christian. <gasps> You're right. It is demeaning to the very character and the goodness of God mm -hmm. to say that he would save someone and not affect a change in their life. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. That change manifests itself differently for different people. We don't all change the same way or at the same speeds or the same amounts. But mark it down. If God saves a sinner, he will change them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Grace works out a practical piety in our life. And if you truly love him, you'll love the things he loves and hate the things he hates. Grace does not eliminate our need for obedience and holiness. The gospel does not teach us, well, now that you're saved, you have no obligations. But rather, grace puts within us both the desire and the ability to meet the need. Amen. What did Paul say? He said the law 
is holy, just, and good. There's no problem with the law of God. The law of God is a wonderful, glorious thing. The problem is with us. Mm -hmm. So, the Bible says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And we need to day by day walk in light of that inward man. Because now we have not only the desire to serve and obey God, but by His grace, bless God, we have the ability. Not a perfect ability, but we have the ability. By grace, listen to this, by grace, you have the ability to actually do something that pleases God. Amen. You're you right. could never do that before you were saved. As a lost individual, nothing you ever do will please Him. Amen. But as a Christian... Because of His grace. Not because of any goodness within you. But because of His transforming grace. You are able Amen. to please Him. What a delight. Mm -hmm. What a delight. Those of you. Remember those days in your childhood. You remember whatever it might have been that you were pursuing. Do you remember that feeling of seeking the approval of mom and dad? Mm -hmm. Do you remember that, that feeling of just, you wanted to do something that would cause you to be able to go home and hear attaboy mm -hmm. from dad? Right. And perhaps you did something and boy, you thought, this will finally get it. He's really going to be proud of me. You went home, not a word was said. You were heartbroken. And it's like that in the Christian life. And grace is that which God gives us that allows us to do that thing that pleases our Heavenly Father. And if you're a true child of God, you'll never be satisfied without the approval of your Heavenly Father. Amen. Now, natural families, because of sin, Sons and daughters will be rebellious and they'll say, I don't care about what mom and dad think. I'm going to do what I want to do. Mm. But any born again Christian can't live with such an attitude right. towards God. And if you have that attitude towards God, then search your own heart mm. to see if you're really his child. Do you desire to please him? Well, Paul says, if you've experienced the saving grace of God, you're going to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and you're going to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Amen. This transforming grace will be a present reality in your life. Because God desires to manifest His saving power through His saved people. Amen. So how does God want to communicate this grace to the world? Through you. Amen. Man, there's something different about that guy. There's something different about her. What happened to her? Mm -hmm. She experienced the saving grace of God. That's what happened. Our testimony is not the elevator speech that we give before the church twice a year. Right. Our testimony is the consistency with which we live our lives. Do you realize you have a testimony at all times? Mm -hmm. Right yeah. now, you have a testimony before You're the world. Right. Mm -hmm. On the job site, you have a testimony there. Wherever you are, you're always giving your testimony. How that, that ought to cause us to live soberly and circumspectly. That's the first coming. That's what Jesus came to teach us in his ministry on this earth. But then Paul, in verse 13, makes a transition. And he begins to speak of the second coming. Amen. He says, looking for that blessed hope. Mm -hmm. Speaks of earnestly waiting on and anticipating with all confidence. See, it's a blessed hope because Paul is not talking about some fond human wish. But he's declaring a divine certitude. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the way we use hope today is different from the way the Bible uses the word hope. We say, well, I hope so. And what we mean by that is 
I don't really know what's going to happen, but this is what I really want to happen. Mm -hmm. I hope it doesn't rain on Tuesday. I don't know if it's going to rain or not. Even does the weatherman, by the way. Amen? That's right. <laughs> but that's what I want. I don't want it to rain. Right? So I say I, I hope it doesn't. But when the Bible uses the word hope, it, it's very different. The Bible uses the word hope like this. When Paul says, this is our hope, what he's saying is, this is something that we know beyond the shadow of a doubt. It will come to pass. And we can base our life upon it coming to pass. Amen. That's a biblical hope. So when he says, we are looking for that blessed hope, he's not saying, well, maybe Jesus will come back someday. We're going to sit here and cross our fingers and twiddle our thumbs. No, he's saying, we know. The Bible declares and Jesus himself declared that he's coming again someday. And we don't know when, but we know that it will happen. And therefore, we can base our life upon that hope. Amen. That's the blessed hope. The blessed hope understands Christ. Sometimes we want the stuff of heaven. Do we want the God of heaven? Mm. Amen. You know, you'd really get bored walking down those streets of gold. I don't think it'd be too enjoyable looking at those pearly gates if Christ wasn't there. Amen. Amen. You're right. He's the reason why we have a blessed hope. What is it? It's that he will return in glory to receive his people. Amen. It's the glorious appearing. The blessed hope and the glorious appearing to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his glorious appearing because his first appearing, he was veiled in the meekness of human flesh and he humbled himself. But do you realize there will be no humility in that second time? Amen. Amen. But he will appear in the fullness of his radiant, bright, pure glory and all eyes will behold him. Amen. The second coming will be no secret, by the way. He'll come with a shout of an archangel <laughs> and the trump will sound and the clouds will be rolled back as a scroll. And Jesus Christ will appear. Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Amen. What a glorious thought. This is our blessed hope. Our blessed hope is that this life that we live, it's not the end. And our labor is not in vain. Amen. If he's not coming again, it is in vain. What's the point? And here's, there's two pitfalls with this glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's two pitfalls. Don't fall into either one of them. The first is this, thinking, well, it's been 2,000 years, and it could very well be another two, three, four, five thousand years. I've got time to waste. Hmm. Don't think like that. Mm -mm. Don't think like this either. Don't think, well, this return is probably just so imminent that it's pointless to even try to do a lasting work for God. Mm. Don't think that way either. You're right. We're not to be concerned with those things. He's promised, hey, I'm coming again. Now occupy till I come. Amen. Live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world and serve him with gladness. <laughs> oh, one day when the king of glory shall descend. Amen. It'll be worth it all. All our labors, all our heartache, all our trouble, all our sorrow will <laughs> seem as nothing compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen. What a truth. Something we can hang our spiritual hats on. <laughs> Notice the reference to his deity in this verse. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this is not speaking of two persons. It, it, that and there is not talking about two different people. That and there is attributing two different titles to the same person, Jesus Christ. He is first the great God, and he is secondly our Savior. He is the co-equal second person 
of the Godhead. He is the Son of God, and He is God the Son. Amen. And it is He who will appear. Amen. The, the same one that came the first time, the same one that died on the cross, it is He that is coming again. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, Paul climaxes this message and he brings it to a grand crescendo in verse 14 when he speaks of the death of Jesus Christ. Mm. Notice how 13 and 14 connect. Looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself. This who is a reference to the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, of verse 13. Amen. It is He who has died. <laughs> what confidence this should put within us mm -hmm. that our sins are taken far, far, far away. And that God is pleased with the sacrifice of His Son because, friend, it was no mere man that died upon that cross. Amen. You are right. Who died on the cross. Our great God and Savior. He's the one who died upon the cross. He's the one who shed his blood on Calvary. No mere man did that. Amen. Christ did that. Amen. Jehovah did that. You realize that to accomplish the gospel, God punished God on the cross. Mm -hmm. oh, what a mystery. Yeah. And Jesus cried on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why was Jesus forsaken? Because Jesus, who knew no sin, was made to be sin. And on the cross, the full weight of our sin fell upon him, came crashing down upon him. That's it. And the very wrath of the Father was poured out upon the Son so that we could be adopted. How many of you would die for your brother? It's mm. exactly what the Lord Jesus did. You're right. He took our place. He suffered in our stead. He became our substitute on Calvary's cross. And it is this divine nature of Jesus Christ that qualifies him to draw nigh unto God and to atone for an infinite number of sins, but it is his human nature that permitted him to die for sinners because God cannot die. That's Had right. Jesus not been truly man, wasn't part God and part man, he was truly God and truly man. And had he not been, he could have never accomplished what he did on the cross. Right. He's a God man. And he gave Himself. This speaks to the nature of his death. You understand, his death was a voluntary death. He was not forced or compelled to go to Calvary. But he chose to die. You must understand that. Mm -hmm. Amen, you're right. He's the one who humbled himself. He humbled himself. He wasn't humbled, he humbled himself. And it wasn't because the Jews plotted his death, though they did. And it wasn't because an angry mob demanded that the Roman government crucify this man that Pilate had admitted was innocent, though they did. And it wasn't because Judas betrayed him, though he did. But Jesus went to the cross because he loved sinners. Mm -hmm. And he chose to come from the splendors of heaven, knowing his destiny uh, was Golgotha's hill. Mm -hmm. And yet by His grace, by a sovereign choice of love, He humbled Himself to the death of the cross. And on Calvary, He gave us the supreme demonstration of that love by laying down His life for sinners. He didn't die on the cross as a victim. He Amen. died on the cross as a victor. Amen. As He won the all men in verse 11, <laughs> All those given to him by the Father, all those whom he had set an everlasting affection upon, he purchased their life on the cross of Calvary. 
He gave himself for us. Amen. Verse 14. For us. It's the same us in verse 12. Paul's talking to the same group of people. The death of Christ was intended for those who believe and receive him by faith as their Savior. And by receiving that grace are transformed. This is what we call the golden chain of redemption. There's one starting place, and there's one stopping place, and you don't get on halfway in the middle. You don't get off, get off a third of the way through. Put all those who he began this work in, he finishes this work in. Amen. I want to give you four reasons, very quickly, why Jesus Christ died. What was the purpose of his death? Right here in verse 14, all four reasons are in this verse. He gave himself for us that... That is the reason. That. Well, what's the that? That, number one, he died that he might purchase a people. Mm -hmm. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. Verse 14. It's language. It pictures that of a slave market. Mm -hmm. Imagine this. In the first century, Asia Minor, okay? Slave auction. Paul is using the imagery that his audience would have been very familiar with. And in ancient times, here's the way slavery worked. If you had a personal debt that you could not pay, and there was no way you could work it off and get it paid off in time, you were allowed to sell yourself into slavery. And you would sell yourself on the slave market and someone would come along and they would purchase you. And they would pay the price of your redemption to whoever you owed that debt to. And then you would go and be a slave to the one who has bought you off the slave market. Right. And Paul uses this imagery to picture what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. See, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. You're right. And all of you have worked so hard for those wages. And you deserve the full recompense of your wages. And you have a debt upon your head. And that debt is the debt of death. Mm -hmm. And you can't pay it back. Even for all eternity, you'll never be able to fully pay off that debt. And so Jesus Christ, seeing the captivity and the bondage of his people in the slave market of sin, and knowing the price of their redemption, was nothing short of death. He went to the cross, and he paid it in full. Amen. Paid it in full. And you know what? He didn't pay it to the devil. You're right. He made that payment to God the Father. You're right. Amen. We have transgressed the law of God. It was God the Father to whom we were found in contempt. And Jesus Christ offered up his precious blood and he went to the mercy seat in heaven and he said, Father, here is the full payment for all of their sin debt. Amen. That's what Christ has done in his life and in his death. And so what happens to us? Who are on that slave market of sin. Our debt has just been paid. Who are not free to just go live our own life. No, we're a slave. Amen. We're a bond servant to our glorious Redeemer who has bought us off of that auction block. And our life is not our own. We've been bought with a price. Mm -hmm. Amen. And He provides us all that we'll ever need, all of our sustenance. He cares for us. He loves us. He communes with us as we serve Him. Jesus Christ died, number one, to purchase a people, but secondly, He died to purify a people. So when you buy a slave off of the auction block, that slave is dirty, malnourished, wearing tattered rags and garments. <laughs> We're not fit for communion with Christ. So what does he do after he redeems us? He begins to sanctify us through purifying grace. Mm -hmm. He begins to fashion us and to cleanse us and to thoroughly wash us. See, we had sin-stained, tattered garments when we first became his. Mm -hmm. uh, what a glorious 
feeling it is to know that you're redeemed. But sometimes it takes years and years for the guilt of sin to be washed away right. through the sanctifying work of God. And that's what He's doing in all of your hearts. And there'll be things that when you were first saved and you first came to be a Christian, there were things that you had done previously that, that just ate you up on the inside. But by His grace, you don't hardly think about those things today. And you, and you shouldn't. Uh, They're under the blood. Amen. They've been washed away. Why? Because Christ is purifying His people. He's washing us. Not only is He taking away our guilt, but He's adding to us a practical righteousness. He's purging our sins. Mm -hmm. I detest the damnable doctrine of purgatory. Friend, the only right. place of purgatory is Mount Calvary. The cross is the only place where your sins will ever be purged. Amen. You'll not go to some go-between place and have them mediated by the prayers of the saints. I couldn't pray one sin out of you because I can't pray a sin out of me. It's him. It comes out of the grace of God. He purifies his people. Thirdly, he died to possess a people. <laughs> to possess a people. Notice what he says. Verse 14. That he might purify unto himself a peculiar people. Now this word peculiar doesn't just mean funny looking. Uh, though I've preached in some places that had both kinds of peculiar people. <laughs> This word peculiar, it means a very special, personalized, unique possession that only belongs to one person. If we're Christ's peculiar possession, that means we can't belong to anyone else. He's jealous over us with a godly jealousy. He's not going to share us. Amen. He died that we might be his. And so we come to him and we say, Lord, I want to be yours four days a week, but can I be someone else's three days a week? And he would say, well, did that person die for you? Because I did. Hmm. So think about that. The next time you want to yield yourself to anything but him, whatever that thing is, ask yourself, did, did, did that thing die for me on a cross 2,000 years ago? Did this person that I, I'm placing over, the Lord Jesus Christ, did they shed their blood for me? If they didn't, you have no right being theirs. You're his. Mm -hmm. He died to possess a people, and they're a peculiar people. And we are, get this, we are the Father's love gift to the Son. And there in eternity, the Father... Who loved the Son? By the way, the love between the Father and the Son is greater than any other love Amen. ever been known. And the Father loved His Son, and the Father declared, Son, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you this innumerable company that will praise you and glorify you forever and forever. And that included you, that included me. Those who believe on Christ. Mm -hmm. And God the Father says, I'm going to give you this gift. But there's one catch. You're going to have to go and redeem them. Mm -hmm. So he gave the love gift to the Son. And the Son went, and on the cross, he received his love gift from the Father. And as he took that peculiar people... And we are now adopted into his spiritual family. See, Christ is not like those other pagan gods that want nothing to do with their people. He desires to have an intimate and personal relationship with you mm -hmm. and live and dwell in your heart. And the last reason that Christ died, according to verse 14, for many good reasons, but verse 14 has four of them. Many of you are glad it doesn't have seven or eight. Amen? <laughs> the last reason. He died to propel a people. What do I mean? Well, they're zealous of good works. They have a zeal. They have some 
something motivating them. They have something, if you will, propelling them to good works. Amen. Yet that's not a natural thing. The natural man does not desire to do good works for God. But Christ, by His grace, the end of His death, the, the effect of His death, He radically transforms us. He dramatically changes us. He's going to come again, so we don't need to worry about that. But He has given us this desire to, until He comes to pursue after good works. Amen. You know, Christ didn't die so that we could coast into heaven on the skin of our teeth. Right. Amen. Christ died so that we could triumphantly march into glory with an abundance of crowns to cast at his feet. And I don't know about you, but that's what I want to do in heaven. I want to go to heaven and say, Lord, look at what you did through me. Who would have ever believed, Lord, that you could have used me to do this and this and this, and here's all the glory for it. Amen. That's what we're called to do. Hmm. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb. The grace of God hath appeared into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. And Christ has died to turn rebellious sinners into the trophies of His grace. He has made the enemies of God the servants of God. Amen. And so I ask you, have you received this grace? When we've talked about many marks of saving grace. I'm not going to give you the post-game recap. I believe the invitation is in the message. Do you have the saving grace of God? Has it transformed you? Has it given you new desires? Has it washed you? Pray that you make your calling and election sure. Amen. We're accustomed to hearing around here. Thank God that we are. And may we glorify the Lamb of God for what He has done on Calvary's cross. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the grace of God that hath appeared into our own hearts and lives and the transforming power of this grace. Lord, would you exalt the Son of God in our hearts today and would you encourage us to serve you in light of tragedy, in light of heartache, in light of sadness, in light of depression. Would you propel your people that you've purchased and possessed do all that you would desire to do with us. Make us trophies of your grace. Purge us and cleanse us, O oh God. Help us to serve you consistently, lovingly, and faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.